Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Smart Human Podcast. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Dr. Jessica Ware, evolutionary biologist and entomologist, and associate curator in invertebrate zoology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. On today's episode, we're talking cicadas, tick-borne illness, climate change effects on both humans and bugs, pesticides, and much, much more. So please stay tuned. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Smart Human Podcast. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Jessica Ware, who is an associate curator in invertebrate zoology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. Dr. Ware's research focuses on the evolution of behavioral and physiological adaptations in insects with an emphasis on how these occur in dragonflies, damselflies, termites, cockroaches, and mantises. She was an associate professor of evolutionary biology at Rutgers University in New Jersey. She is the current president of the Worldwide Dragonfly Association and VP of the Entomological, did I say that right, Society of America. She was recently awarded a P-Case medal. Uh, maybe she can tell us a little bit about that from the U.S. government for her work on insect evolution in 2019. Welcome to the show, my friend, Dr. Jessica Ware. Thank you so much, Dr. Cohen. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, tell me a little bit. I guess we'll start off really with a bang here. What is an entomologist? Well, it's such a broad field. So if you're an entomologist, that could mean a lot of different things. Um, some people who are entomologists are really concerned with health. So they're concerned with vector biology, with in many insects vector diseases that are problematic for um, veterinary animals and for humans. Um, like dengue, like yellow fever and things like that, West Nile, um, Zika, uh, chikungunya. And so many people who are entomologists, their whole life really revolves around trying to solve this problem of how to get rid of these vectors of illnesses. Others are really concerned with, with, um, food control and making sure that food is sustainably produced. We grow a lot of food and we're in competition with insects who also want to eat the food that we're growing. And these crop pests are something that humans have been dealing with for as long as there has been agriculture. Um, then there are folks like myself, um, and I'm really in the ecology and evolution wing of entomology. So we're interested in understanding the evolutionary history of insects over the last 400 million years or so. Um, and some of us are interested in, in kind of documenting biodiversity um, and making, um, I guess, plans for conservation um, of, you know, this is the most abundant organism on the planet. A million species of insects have been described. That's a lot. I mean, there's only 6,500 mammals. Uh, we know a lot about mammals, but there's a million species of insects. But we think maybe there's 5 million, 10 million, 30 million that yet have not, they have not yet been described. So this is a really big field, the kind of systematics, evolutionary biology section of, of entomology. And then lastly, there's kind of a group that really focus on using insects for genetics and for biotechnology and bio-inspired design. So when you say someone's an entomologist, it really could mean ev everything from like sitting on a tractor and doing integrated pest management to, you know, working in a biotechnology lab, you know, um, doing something with CRISPR-Cas9 or something like that. So it's a real varied field. So you go into it as sort of a general heading, but you can sort of subset into areas of interest that, that really pique your interest. I think so. I can remember yeah. when I was an undergraduate student uh, taking entomology classes, and I had a peer uh, who was taking a bunch of pest management classes. And I said, why are you taking those? And he said, well, I want to be an entomologist. And I thought, I want to be an entomologist. I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, that was when it really occurred to me, oh, you, there's lots of different ways to be an entomologist. That's great. And so, so tell me a little bit about your journey, speaking about how focused you are and the work you're doing in your specific area. How did you, how did you end up, do you believe, how did, how did you get here? How, how did you choose this area? And did it actually stem, like give us the, the play by play and sort of your, your training, but also even your childhood and how that may have influenced where you are now? Um, well, I would say I didn't know any entomologists growing up. I think few of us do. I mean, you do. <laughs> Your kids do. Cause you I, are the I... first. You are the first. <laughs> and actually, I met you because you were teaching my kids. Um, we live in the same town. For those listeners that are interested, we live in the same town. Um, 
which is pretty remarkable to have such a, a special person in your town. And you were kind enough to actually teach my kids and a lot of the neighborhood kids um, in an after school program um, on, on entomology, which was the first I'd ever heard of such a thing, which is crazy, but, but true. Yeah, it's remarkable. I think the friendly neighborhood entomologist, I think, is a rare <laughs> title to have, I suppose. Um, actually, as a, as a side note, someone who went to the career day at our the, the school in our town that saw me give an entomology talk ended up going on to being an entomologist. She just got oh, her degree wow. in Cornell in That's entomology. Cool. So you never know uh, what you could how you could influence someone. But I didn't have that. So uh, in Canada, which is where I'm from, um, I didn't know any entomologists. Um, and no one in my family really was interested in science. They were either artists or my dad had been in the Marine Corps um, and then had gone on to sell computers <laughs> at a small computer company in, in Toronto when he moved to, to Canada. So um, my, one of my parents' friends suggested that since I spent a lot of time, you know, in the water and swimming, maybe I would like oceanography. Uh, and so I decided to go for marine biology at UBC in Vancouver. And while I was there, I was really interested in invertebrates because um, it seemed like everybody was interested in whales. And I didn't want to do every, something that everybody else was doing. I wanted to do something unique and maybe where there would be less competition. And so I thought maybe, you know, maybe freshwater sponges are my future, right? So I decided to go and start taking invertebrate classes. And when you take those classes, invertebrate zoology, you learn that, that almost all invertebrates, and in fact, almost all life, are insects. And that then that's what kind of hooked me. There's a lot of insects out there. There's not enough people studying them. And you could really, it's still, it's a wild, wild west in some ways where you could, you're still making discoveries. You're still finding out new things um, in a way that people who are studying whales, um, I'm not saying they've plateaued. There's still lots to know about whales, but there's a lot of really groundbreaking discovery that still is happening daily uh, in entomology. And that was exciting for me. But I wasn't sure what type of entomology I wanted to do. I did have the opportunity to go as a field assistant uh, while I was an undergraduate to Costa Rica with someone for one semester. He was doing ecology work. So we were working on artificial um, bromeliads, are, are plants that hold water between the bracts of their leaves. If you picture a pineapple, pineapples mm -hmm. are in the bromeliad um, group and the top of a pineapple, uh, you know how water can, if you poured water on a pineapple, water would collect amongst the little, the, the bracts of the, the top of the pineapple. Well, anyways, insects lay their eggs inside that water and they can develop in that water. That's actually a habitat called a phytotelm mm. or, or telma, phytotelmata. Um, and so we were studying those in, in the Costa Rican rainforest. Uh, no electricity, no running water, uh, no contact with the outside world for, for, oh for three months. And I thought, this could, this is pretty good. This is a good job. I could see myself doing this. But then when I came back to UBC and I was finishing my, my studies, uh, the other uh, work study jobs, I was doing this as a work study student, that I had were in integrated pest management. And in these labs, people were using naturally occurring enemies of pest insects to try and control pest insects. Um, so there's naturally occurring bacteria, naturally occurring um, viruses, nuclear polyhedra virus is one of them, um, and other things to try and control cabbage looper, uh, mm -hmm. which is something that, you know, is a pest of, of tomato and cucumber and peppers and things like this. And when I was working on those projects, I thought, this actually feels like I'm doing something to save humanity. Um, you know, food security is something that not everybody has a food secure life. And so this is something that I could do that would actually have an impact. So when I went to apply for graduate school, I took some time off. And then when I was applying to graduate school, I thought for sure I would do integrated pest management because I wanted to have, you know, an impact that would uh, be substantial for the human condition. But when I went to graduate school, I went to join a lab working on entomopathogenic nematodes, which are nematodes that naturally occur in the soil that infect insects. And they, they basically reproduce inside the insect and the insect explodes and all the nematodes go out into the soil and that can infect another insect. Well, humans want to try and harness that. They, will, they want to try and grow these nematodes and then freeze dry them and then be able to sell them to people, um, you know, farmers, that they could just sprinkle these nematodes on their crops and they wouldn't have to use pesticides. And I thought, this is great. Oh, man, I want to do this. So I moved to go do this PhD project. And it turns out the research was a lot of looking in a microscope, counting nematodes, 1,000, 1,001, 1,002. And for a variety of reasons, it wasn't as, it wasn't the the fun PhD experience I thought I was going to really love. So it was inspiring. Actually, yeah. 
<laughs> it wasn't clicking, so I, so click, I, click, 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 basically. So I, I ended up switching. Um, I was re- I was taking evolutionary biology classes and insect taxonomy classes at the same time as part of the graduate curriculum. Um, and that was so interesting. And so then I ended up kind of making a radical switch. And I thought, you know, there's other ways to help the human condition and understanding biodiversity, understanding the last 400 million years of evolution, that also can help the human condition. I'm doing it. And so then I switched and never looked back. And it's been kind of team evolution ever since. I think it's fascinating. And, you know, just to draw some connections, I think that there is no better way to look at where we are now than to look at our past. I mean, I think anthropology is such a critical component of even medicine, which no one even thinks about. Um, How did we get here after millions of years of evolution? And how similar are we to those, um, you know, creatures that supposedly began our whole process? But you know, I, I think it's it's fascinating that you, you have gotten to a point where you're so specialized, you're winning awards for the work that you're doing. Um, and you've now recently been elevated to this, you know, to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, which I think is just remarkable. So um, congratulations for all that great work. Thanks. And now I want to pick your brain about a lot of different things. So I guess one of the things I wanted to start with, um, well, first of all, We've just had this, I know you're probably sick of this conversation, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Cicadas! Cicadas! Tell us a little bit about cicadas and why this is so unique. We're in New Jersey. We've just had this onslaught of cicada um, eruption coming out of the ground after 17 years. And I actually remember it back when I was in eighth grade in Princeton at my high school graduation. My friends and I were- uh, I, I think so. I can't do the math. My friends did the math on Facebook and and basically came up with the fact that that was my eighth grade graduation and who the teacher was. And she was making these connections and metaphors to our lives. So tell us a little bit about the cicadas and should we be freaked out if one lands on our leg? Uh, well, I think we should look at the cicadas as a gift. There's not a lot that we could say uh, is truly a New Jersey experience. Um, but Brood 10, which is the largest of the broods, there's 15 broods in America. Uh, they actually exist only really on the East Coast, a little bit in the Midwest. Um, it's a unique phenomenon. But Brood 10 is the largest of the broods, and its epicenter is kind of Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Princeton, you know, in like this part of New Jersey. So if there's something we could be proud of other than pork roll or Yay. whatever it is in New Jersey. And uh, shopping shopping this. malls. We have lots of shopping malls. Don't forget <laughs> that, Dr. Ware. Okay, go shopping ahead. Shopping malls. Yeah, shopping malls, pork roll, and cicadas. Cicadas. Can be our, our things. So, I mean, just as you remember that in 1987, I mean, uh, Bob Dylan, I'm sure, remembers it because he wrote a song about it in 1970. But so, too, have humans for a very long time. For as long as there have been humans, as far as we know, people have been documenting this as a remarkable phenomenon every 17 years. First Nations people, the Haudenosaunee people, like the Onondaga, they were documenting it, you know, when early cult in the colonial people first arrived here, they were like, goodness gracious, what's this? So people have been excited about it every 17 years. And so why, why shouldn't we? This is, um, you know, a naturally occurring uh, strategy where by staying as a juvenile stage for 17 or 13 years in southern states uh, for 17 years, um, it allows you to kind of avoid um, having a predator that is adapted to specifically feed on you. It's a prime number which is only divisible by itself in one. And so they think that's actually part of the strategy um, hmm. for being underground for 17 or 13 years. But then also when they emerge, they emerge in these mass numbers, which I found delightful. Not everybody did find it delightful this year, but it's a strategy. It's it's a competitive exclusion strategy. So there's so many of you, you can kind of outcompete any other cicadas and any other things that are out at that time. But also it satiates the satiation strategy. It satiates the predators that are that might be eating you, birds, um, squirrels, raccoons, your cats, your dogs, um, so that hopefully your siblings all get eaten and then the raccoon is so full, it doesn't eat you. You can live to mate and pass your genes on to the next generation. That's kind of the strategy that they're that they're doing. And so there's three species that make up the brood that's out right now. Um, and each one is slightly different. They sing, males all in cicadas, they all make a sound and the sound tells the female something about the quality of the mate, but it also is species specific, the pattern. So some of them 
in the town that we live in, I heard quite a few of the kind that's called a pharaoh cicada. And it sounds like pharaoh, pharaoh, pharaoh. That's what the call sounds like. Huh. But there's three other, there's two other calls. Um, and females are listening. Uh, is this the same species as me? And if that's, a, if that's a yes, it's like a decision chart. If it's a yes, then how good of a singer is he? If he can sing really loud and long in the hottest part of the day, that means he probably isn't full of disease or parasites. He probably is a wow. good mate. He probably is a good singer. And that means my sons will be good singers. And that means they will be chosen by a female. So it's a, it's a long, complicated uh, series of things that happen when they mate. <laughs> It's so cool. I think, that, I think it's I cool. think that's so fascinating. I mean, it is fascinating. I'm not sure if I would say it's fascinating when they land on me, but they are fascinating to hear about personally. And I, I actually saw, because we're connected on social media, that you were eating a cicada sandwich. Is that correct? Well, Where was that? I mean, technically, technically, they were toppings on my Memorial Day burger. But uh, yeah, for <laughs> I, cicadas are a great food source. So, I mean, mammals in general have been eating them, for, like I said, for as long as there have been cicadas, which is a long time. Um, and why not us? So humans have been eating them for a long time. Um, in fact, the Haudenosaunee people I mentioned, uh, they actually, when their crops were burnt by George Washington, um, when there was uh, fighting between the col um, colonial settlers and First Nations people, they actually survived that year because of a cicada emergence that allowed them to survive uh, because it's a lot of food. Uh, it's high protein. Uh, it has fat in it as well. Um, I don't know the exact nutritional components of each of the cicadas, and it does probably vary, but they basically consume, um, you know, plant sap, xylem, the whole time they're underground. So they're on this liquidy, sugary diet, just storing fat for when they're an adult. Um, and they have a lot of muscles that are associated with the vibration that they need to make for the sound. So I thought they were delicious. I would recommend, I would I would highly recommend them. <laughs> no, I, I think it's fascinating because, they're, you know, in the health and wellness world, because we have a lot of different, you know, guests that come on and some are from, you know, um, uh, the chemical world, um, environmental chemicals, some are from the health and wellness world, some are from medicine. And it's interesting how all of these things intersect because there are lots of information that show, as you mentioned, that, that insects are going to be a really important staple for food if it, it becomes an issue with, with food access. You know, and we'll talk about climate change because I do want to get into that. But it's interesting how they're touted, especially um, grasshoppers and in parts of the world, where there's no food insecurity, there's still a delight. I mean, people are eating insects out of choice, not by necessity. So I find that really interesting. Um, and of course, you know, as you said, the numbers, they're outweighing, you know, outnumbering us by far, by, you know, a thousand fold. So, so it makes sense. Um, certainly better for the planet than feeding cows and eating beef, I would say. Um, but that was really interesting to see. And so um, I'm glad you had a nice meal. I was actually sitting there tempting to say, hey, wait, does it taste like chicken? Um, but I'm sure you have always, you, you know, lots of people ask you those questions. Um, okay, so cicadas was something I definitely wanted to hit. And now uh, the other question about cicadas is you said 13 or 17 years. So it's not that every brood is 17 years. Some are 13, some are 17. And it also depends on sort of their location of where they come out of the ground. Researchers think that the 13-year cicadas used to be 17 years. But as, you know, they're in further parts of the they're in more southern parts of the range it has become a 13 year cicada and with climate change it seems like we've had a few cicadas so they're 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 marking time by the composition of the sap because the composition of the sap changes in winter and summer and so they're getting these chemical cues from what they're drinking and they're kind of also molting to larger and larger um uh, in stars uh, until finally it's time to emerge but that counting is you know can be thrown off by climate um, and so there have been a few examples of 17 year cicadas that came out several years early and when mm. they do that if they're not protected by the sheer numbers they just quickly get eaten by birds and, and other and mammals um, and so the I one hypothesis is that we'll start seeing the t the duration of time between these emergences get smaller and smaller as the climate gets warmer and warmer. Yeah, that's interesting. So I since since we're on climate change, that's that's one of the big questions I had for you was how do you see the insect populations? And of course, there's so many of them. But how do you see? You know, we we're, we're already hearing about species kind of dying out of birds. Birds, you know, prey on insects, of course. 
Um, and there's this ecosystem, the bugs on the plants, the, the birds eat the bugs on the plants, you know, like there's, there's an entire ecosystem here that almost studying one doesn't do justice unless you study the whole, you know, the, the context of which these, these creatures live. So what are the big issues with climate change that are really starting to be more obvious um, as an entomologist? And what concerns you as we move forward in this, in this area? Well, in the last five or six years or so, some studies that have come out that are real that really do as an entomologist and as a citizen uh, make me scared. Um, and part of what makes me scared is that we don't have a lot of good baseline data to really know how to interpret the, the results of these studies. Um, but basically what the studies show is in long term, and by long term, I mean 20 to 30 year long studies, they found that insects were declining by upwards of 70% um, in terms of sheer biomass. In some, cases, in some cases, they've looked at actual numbers of species. And what we're seeing is that massive insect decline seems to be the story that's coming out of Germany, that's coming out of Puerto Rico, that's coming out of different, different locations where people are doing these studies. For some taxa like dragonflies and damselflies, we do not have baseline data to know how big a population is. So for us, if we were to, to look at something, we have no way of knowing whether the population is smaller now than it was in the past. It seems like there's some slight differences, but depending on whether it's an aquatic insect or a terrestrial insect. But overall, the theme is that the number of species and the number of total individuals in a population is dropped dramatically since the 70s. What That's bad for a variety of reasons, like you mentioned, um, including the fact that there are the primary diet of many insectivores. Um, but also, you know, some insects do these services, these kind of ecosystem services, like pollinating the crops that we, we rely on as humans um, to survive. Um, it's not just bees that pollinate things. There's many insects that, that serve as pollinators. Um, but also, when uh, you have a big part of the, the food chain um, starting to decline like that, you will expect that other members of the food chain will also fall. This mm -hmm. is um, a, a warning that humans could choose to listen to or they could choose to ignore. For my part and for many of my peers, what we've chosen to do as to heed this warning is to start collecting a lot of baseline data. So I was just doing mark recapture analysis, which is a way of kind of estimating a population size um, in a pond sort of near um, here and with a bunch of dragonfly people around the world in Cameroon and Nigeria and Jamaica, like all around the world, we've all been spending this summer um, and the fall collecting data so that we can try and get an estimate of what the baseline kind of population size is for different species of dragonflies so that as we do this yearly, we can be able to estimate the magnitude of the drop of the decline. And I think many of my peers are, are doing the same. But of course, all of our efforts um, really don't mean as much if there isn't policymakers who are also right. listening to this this challenge. Something needs to change. Inevitably, um, it will be hard to know exactly what's causing the decline because it's probably an additive effect and there's probably multiple things that are affecting the decline um, from kind of broad spectrum pesticide use to increasing temperatures to decreasing amounts of habitat availability, forest fragmentation, etc. Probably all of these things in an additive fashion are resulting in this. But this is, I think, one of the most pressing things in entomology today. Yeah, I mean, you, you just hit upon, you know, one of my um, beefs that I have, which is, you know, sort of this this worldwide enormous ubiquity of, of pesticides, which, you know, pesticides imply that it's a killer of creatures, whether it's a an insecticide, herbicide, you know, for for weeds. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess you don't have the data to actually concretely say the cause and effect. There's very little in life that we can actually say are cause and effect. We can say associations and certainly confounders. But, um, you know, we live in a town, I mean, this, this is a good segue. We live in a town um, in New Jersey that, you know, in New Jersey is the garden state. Um, so we have lots of plants and lots of farming and lots of um, spraying. And, you know, it's one of those situations where as an entomologist, I can imagine as I'm I'm running through the town and seeing mosquito services sitting parked outside of actually your neighbor's house spraying, 
I thought that was interesting. And then, of course, I have farmland behind us that's sprayed by our local farmers. Um, and I have to battle every year with them in a warm, warm, kind way, trying to figure out what they're spraying, when they're spraying, when there's warning. Um, and then I have to go down a rabbit hole of figuring out, you know, the health effects of those sprays. So I guess the question I have is, you know, you, you're doing your work. What, what are you, your love is, is as these creatures? What do you feel when you see people next to you, neighbors even uh, spraying? Uh, and, and, and how does that affect who you are and what you do? Well, I mean, this, so this year is a good example. Um, we were so excited about the cicada emergence. You know, people had been waiting uh, since 2004. And what we saw was that cicadas were um, in fewer numbers than what would have been expected. And they were incredibly patchy. And even hmm. if you look at Princeton, which is an epicenter, there would be one lawn that would be covered in cicadas and another lawn where there wasn't a single cicada. You know, and I, of course, don't have the data. I didn't go through and knock on everybody's door. Right. But I do wonder the impact of people drenching their lawns with the mosquito control slash fertilizer combo that has become so popular in New Jersey, whether all of that just seeps into the soil, which is where these cicada nymphs are developing. I wonder if that is why we saw such patchiness this time around. Um, it's not just that people suddenly cut down all of their trees. Like the trees were there. There were old trees. Um, we would have expected them to be in Cranberry as they were in 2004, but we saw very, very few of them um, emerging. So I do, th it does make me feel, uh, well, I guess a polite way to say it would be to say I feel irritated because I feel like um, it's frustrating to see people make choices that I think aren't necessarily informed, um, uh, are informed decisions. Just the other day, there was a knock at the door, and I opened it, and there was somebody there on a Segway who had an iPad, and he said, I just want you to know, we're here spraying your neighbor's uh, lawn for all these pests, and he had, there was a thumbnail of all these pests. These are all the pests that could possibly be in your home and your yard, so we'd like to make a deal with you today. And I looked at the man, and I said, I'm an entomologist, and he, oh, he said, oh, sorry. He closed the iPad and just went off on his Segway. All, that's all I had to say to him because he, if if I was an entomologist, I of course would know that what he was selling was not necessarily the best product. Entomologists you rely on pesticides in some cases to deal with extreme infestations that are going to threaten food security and make it that humans starve. Entomologists do not advocate for broad spectrum use of pesticides by the general public in for things like like lawns. Um, right. <laughs> you know right. that. Like I could think of it in, in general in entomology, the, the shift has really been towards integrated pest management, where the goal is to try and use biological control wherever possible, unless it's unless, you know, it's the crops destruction is so bad that people are going to humans will starve and die. Then they then they would advocate the use of certain pesticides. So when he. I could, I know, I could read that, that he knew that that is the case, and that's why he got on his Segway, and that's why he he sped away. Um, so I, it really frustrates me. It frustrates me that yeah. people leave their lights on in front of their house all day and all night, and that disrupts. You know, fireflies need to make flashes. The flashes are species specific. Firefly numbers are plummeting because of light pollution. Um, like, there's just so many things that people are making these really simple decisions. Should I leave the light on or off? And they choose to leave it on. Should I spray the lawn because I like sitting outside and never getting bitten? And they choose to spray. It's frustrating because I think I think it's it, we just don't do a good job educating people on what how they're in how the decisions they make actually impact people beyond their little square patch of New Jersey. Yeah, I think it's I think it's fascinating. And and when you bring that to light, you know, I start to think, do I leave my lights on too long? You know, and here I am thinking mostly from my angle as human health, I'll, I'll stop someone spraying, you know, Roundup literally in our town. And I'll be like, please put on gloves and mask and don't use this if you don't have to, because you're using it. It gets into your skin. It gets into your body. You know, we now have plenty of data showing, um, uh, you know, quite a bit of harm associated with exposures to glyphosate, which is Roundup and, you know, a bunch of other stuff. Um, but I'm I'm not looking at through the eyes of a, of, a, of a bug lover, you know, and I think that that's where, you know, when we can teach children, especially um, adults and children, you know, how all of these communities are connected, 
how when we dirty water, it becomes our drinking water. It becomes the water for plants and animals and wildlife and how water gets reused and recycled back into our lives. It's there's not just one spot in time and one, you know, um, area of concern is how the connectedness matters, um, yeah. which is which. I, I wanted to get into our next topic. We have lots of topics. I could be here all day, but I know you're busy. Um, tell me a little bit about your, um, your venture that you recently, uh, you have a new book. Um, speaking of education, which we both like to do, tell me a little bit about your education work and how it led to this beautiful project um, with a new book coming out that's called um, a day in the life bugs. What do bees, ants, and dragonflies get up to all day? <laughs> so tell us about well, that book. I think like in general, my, I've always seen my mission has been, uh, you know, in the broader scheme of things, other than like, you know, trying to actually figure out what the tree of life is for dragonflies. That's my, I guess maybe that's my ultimate goal. But other than that, my, my mission has really been to try and change people's perspective when of what they picture when they picture what an entomologist is and what they picture when they hear the word entomology. Um, and I think that what we see when we, if you've ever been around people who are younger than a teenager, you'll notice that they are innately curious about the natural world. I mean, humans in some ways have been selected for this over evolutionary time to be curious about the natural world. You'll see children picking up worms and pointing at butterflies and, and being interested in insects. And then they learn from, it's learned behavior, the psychology um, studies who have been done, who have been done, that have been done on, on children that show that this is learned behavior. People teach children to be afraid of insects. Um, and so, what we can do as entomologists to try and advocate for entomology, to advocate for the, for this really, really abundant, there's 10 quintillion insects on the earth, that's one followed by 18 zeros. There's a lot of insects that for us to advocate for them is to try and show the fascinating things about them that we may have learn to hate as a teenager if our kid if our friend said that it wasn't cool or maybe our mother or, or parent said that it they were scary um and so you know educating people by talking about the data the day in the life of of an insect can be a really fun way to show these many of the insects uh, in fact a majority of insects um live their lives really outside of the human condition. They Their their whole life history has nothing to do with humans. There's a few insects that we know and, and maybe detest, like the American cockroach, who really have modified their life history strategy to be in, to, to associate with human dwellings. But those are by far the exceptions across the million species of insects that are out there. The, like, the, the vast majority of them um, really live their lives to do the same thing that's the genetic imperative of life on earth, you know, find a mate, dis mate, disperse, um, pass your genes on to the next generation. That's what everyone's doing. That's what we're doing. That's what plants are doing. That's what birds are doing. And that's what insects are doing. And insects have, have learned to do this in a really remarkable way. In some cases, um, you know, 400 million years of evolution have allowed they have sex every way possible. They eat every way possible. They disperse every way possible. There's a cool story for everybody. You know, there's things about color. There's things about sound. There's things about movement. Um, and so that's what I tried to hopefully get kids excited about in this kid's book, to talk about all these amazing things that they do. I mean, this is this is more interesting, I would argue, than the average mammal uh, story, um, just because it's mammals are, are, by contrast, a drop in the bucket. I mean, they've only been the rise I think of mammals you have a chip. Like, I think you have a chip on your shoulder about mammals. I can see it. I want to know where that comes huge. from. <laughs> it's You know what it is, Ellie? It's a, um, go, go, go. Uh, Dragonflies have there's the same number of species of dragonflies and damselflies as there are mammals. And it always kind of irked me as a parent that my kids came home from school and they had to learn all the barnyard animals. Um, and they had to learn the sounds and they had to learn how to tell the difference between an ocelot and a leopard. And there's the same number of species as there are dragonflies and damselflies. And they actually, because of my job, saw dragonflies and damselflies an awful lot more than they saw panda. So I just, I just think that it's funny. It's marketing. How... It's marketing. Yeah, it's We've marketing. Had, <laughs> had bad marketing. They need a new PR company. And I think you're yeah. it. I think you're it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe these, maybe this book series will, will finally be the straw that, that kind of pushes them over to being really hugely popular, but I'm not sure. If you say to someone like save the maggots, 
The maggots are in trouble. No one's going to want to save them. Save the ladybugs. They want to save the lady ladybugs. ladybugs. You know, think about the the bugs. The number of bugs that have kind of good PR versus bad PR. When I think about yeah. it, it's a it's a narrow. It's really narrow. Um, you know, it's kind of one of those things where I, I think you're absolutely right. There's just not enough good stuff coming out and details. Um, um, one of the things I wanted to bring up is speaking of PR is, you know, in my world of medicine, you know, I get a lot of Lyme disease cases, chicken yunga, um, chicken gungia. I can't even pronounce it properly. There's all these dengue, yellow fever. I mean, I don't see that as much because we're in Princeton, but you know, for those who travel, these are, um, tick-borne, mosquito-borne illnesses. Um, and I always find it interesting, the work you're doing and how it kind of, again, it funnels, like if I was talking to someone who's in um, clean water management, how it all funnels back to me and sort of my own brain as human health issues. And in terms of, you know, climate change, Lyme disease, amongst others, we're seeing no seasonality. You know, it used to be that spring and summer or spring and um and summer were really um and sometimes the fall but you would see more cases of Lyme and it was a, it was a predictability to it and so when you told me about how you're going to see smaller you, you predict smaller um periods of time between cicadas you know what are your thoughts um you know on how those kind of life-threatening you know not not bugs that are pretty harmless like cicadas they don't do anything to anybody uh, how, how does that play out in your mind in terms of the future of human health from your perspective as an entomologist? Well, one thing that we've noticed already is that, um, for so the way that insects, when entomologists think about insects and what their reproductive potential is, we use these models called degree day models because um, at a certain temperature, an insect will develop at a certain rate. And at a higher temperature, they develop at a slightly faster rate. <clears throat> and at a, at a high enough temperature, then they can develop fast enough that they can get multiple generations in in a given season. So instead of having one round of eggs laid, you could end up having those eggs, a round of eggs laid, them hatch, and have another round of eggs laid, hatch from another generation. Um, we see already some insects shifting the number of generations that they can have in a given season. And what that could mean in terms of sheer numbers could be catastrophe, right? So, um, we see this already for some invasive insects like the brown marmorated stink bug, which does not harm humans, but it harms crops. We're seeing this right now in, in Canada with this invasive species called the gypsy moth, which basically it's normally has these epizootic um, kind of huge population booms every you know 10 or 20 years. But the one that's happening right now is basically defoliated Ontario and Quebec because mm. the, they were able to have more, you know, a faster reproduction um, and more generations in a, in a given amount of time. The same thing can happen with Culex pipians. The same things can happen with mosquitoes um, that vector illnesses. Culex, uh, the Culex complex is the, the genus um, that we have in New Jersey that, you know, transmits East, Eastern equine encephalitis and West Nile virus. Um, we What we will expect is that as the degree day kind of, and the amount of time that's taking for these insects to develop gets shorter with hotter temperatures, um, that could have, that could definitely have consequences in terms of population sizes, which could have, which can have consequences uh, for the, the pathogens that they're vectoring. Um, so I think that um, one, 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 Good thing, I suppose, is that sometimes this also has positive impacts on things like dragonflies, which eat mosquitoes. Mm. Um, uh, but I mean, so far, I don't know of any dragonflies in New Jersey that have multiple generations run summer. They're all kind of like one generation per summer. But I mean, I mean, that's the thing I guess we don't understand is how this kind of cascading effect, of, you know, yeah. impacts all the other players, um, the other actors in this play. But it's definitely something yeah. to be concerned about. Um, this kind of increasing the number of generations, because uh, then that can cause dramatic population booms of things that we really, we should fear. They're the most harmful animals on the planet, which are largely in the order Diptera, which are the flies. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and then we have sometimes, sometimes, I mean, aside from climate change, there's some species that actually are crossing sort of their borders. Since we have such a global world, they're hiking a ride on a freight freight ship from China and they're, they're coming all over the place because, you know, we really have such, you know, we don't have borders anymore really when it comes to travel. Um, and so there was, um, you know, uh, I'm just thinking of a segue that seems natural because there's that crazy looking 
um, what is it, a hornet that's eating uh, bumblebees, and they keep, do you know what I'm talking about? That one, we can always edit this out Asian if you don't want to. Asian giant hornet? Yes, thank you. Asian giant okay. Hornet, yeah. okay, so e- first of all, every time you see a picture in the news, I don't know if they're magnifying it a hundred times, but it looks like it's the next, it's going to be the next, you know, um, you know, superheroes movie. And this is going to be the, the creature in it because it just, it seems like they're magnifying it out of fear and, and it's sort of certainly, uh, you know, trying to get people to be freaked out, which doesn't take much. Um, yeah. Yeah. tell me, do you, do you know much about it? I'm just curious what your thoughts are, because this is sort of the latest PR debacle for insects. If you could call it that it's not a good story. <laughs> Um, creating fear. Yeah, well, I mean, there's no shortage of, like, killer this, killer that that's going to come and, and destroy uh, the, the planet. Um, so far, they really seem to have been localized on the West Coast. But, and yet, I, I get probably one or two photos sent to me per month of someone saying, oh, my God, I found one, you know, family members, neighbors, and it's almost always a European hornet, um, which are also large and which also can eat, uh, you know, the, the bees that we know and love. Um, European hornets are also invasive um, in this part of the world. Uh, in their native range, I actually think that they're declining because people would light fire to their, their nests. Um, hmm. So, I mean, I think that definitely we should be concerned anytime there's um, – you know, a new group of of the of insects that, that kind of invade. But like I said, so far they've been really restricted. Some actually grad students to the rescue, like a group of graduate students actually kind of killed one of the biggest kind of colonies or groups of them that, that have been found. And they froze everything and they're studying them intensively um, to kind wow. of look at their genetics and their genomics and that can tell you how, whether there's been multiple invasions or just a single invasion. Um so I think people are, are really hypersensitive about things like this. But, and however, the, the part of the problem has to do with our infrastructure. The way that we, we monitor for invasive pests is at the ports in New York. You know, we're so close to New York. We are a port. Um, you know, a certain number of crates that come in are inspected. So like 10% of this or 2% of this, depends on what the shipment is, are inspected for insects. Now, you know, insects, uh, the chances of you finding something are pretty slim. Yeah. So yeah. we often don't actually find them until they're already like spotted lanternfly. So they're already all over the landscaping company's property and have been shipped off to different locations. You know, um, brown marmorated stink bug, same thing. It's now a pest across the entire United States. It only has been here since 2004. It didn't take long for it to become a pest across the entire United States. So the best thing we could do is to try and stop these things at the port, but we don't have the human power or the, the infrastructure set up to do that. Um, APHIS workers, as it is, just sit there and identify insects all day, uh, but they're only just doing a tiny fraction because they're only sampling, you know, one tray out of 50 from this type of crop and what, you know, so I think that there's a lot more we could do to actually stop things before they become um, a huge worry. I'm not particularly worried about the Asian giant hornet um, because I think there's other um, invasive uh, insect pests right now that probably will cause much more immediate harm to humanity. Like, I mean, I like to drink things that have grapes in them and spotted lanternfly makes me terrified because they are going to, they're a really serious threat to, uh, to things that we make with grapes. So, <laughs> you know, um, I love grapes. Yeah. So delicious. Yeah. No, I'm going to I'm going to have to bring you some grapes to thank you for doing this interview. Um, because, And I'm going to try to make sure they don't have those flies uh, or their fly yeah. droppings on, I guess, is really the big issue. But um, yeah, I mean, I just I guess, um, you know, bringing bringing sort of that fear factor down a notch is always a good thing. And, you yeah. know, weighing out realism with, you know, you know, with strong data, I think is always a good thing. It's it's just one of those things where whoever controls sort of the the mass media in terms of fear when it comes to health, when it comes to, it, it, you know, it's it's hard to to get through it. It's it's uh, on multiple levels. But that 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 hornet, uh, I'll tell you, keeps me up at night when they start posting it all <laughs> over the place. And everyone seems to, like you said, think that they have one next door, their neighbor. Um so and I think, almost always is not it. <laughs> Just to reassure you, if anyone's oh, listening, I'm almost sure you do not have one. <laughs> I, 
I, I, I think that's uh, I, I think that's good news to hear, believe it or not, especially because we live in the same area. Um, <laughs> so I guess another couple of questions I wanted to ask, you know, do you have any like personal recommendations on how you manage um, or, or what recommendations you would make to people, everyday people who are listening? Because we have a very, you know, um, wide variety of listeners to this podcast with different backgrounds in science and um, health, wellness, what have you. Um, what are some of the recommendations besides turning off your lights? Give me some usable information that we can all do to take better care with bugs, maybe to become more interested in bugs. Um, and I and is bugs an insult, really? I mean, I, I when we say bugs, I almost think that that might be an insulting term because there's just such a beautiful variety of insects that bugs is a little bit too. But tell me what you think. Well, so insects, it's, in, it's interesting. So insects are the group that is everything. And insects are divided up into 27 different orders. And one of those orders is hemiptera, and those are the bugs. So there's actually only one group ah. of insects that are actually bugs. So it's one of those things where all bugs are insects, but not all insects are bugs. So there's all of these things that are insects, and then there's just one little piece that are bugs. But for whatever reason, people tend to use the word bugs. Um, the same way it's bugs are a group just like um, flies are a group or, you know, but we don't call everything a fly. So it's weird that sometimes we call everything a bug, but it's a very common term to use. So I wouldn't feel bad about using it. But just so you know, it's only like the, no, things that's that are interesting. the true bugs, the hemiptera that are, that are the bugs. But I mean, there's, there's things that people could do. I mean, you, you can make choices in, um, like I, like we've talked about in what you put on your lawn. Um, I personally have tried in our backyard. We actually have a really vibrant community that lives in our backyard, um, by not spraying, by having plants that support different types of pollinators at different times of years, at different times of the year. You want to have plants that are for, you know, that are coming up early in the season. So the, when the pollinators are waking up, they have something to drink. Um, and we have things that come out different times of the year. By supporting those, we actually have a lot of food for birds. And by supporting birds, we actually have um, kind of a beautiful song uh, story that's happening in our backyard. Uh, we have bats uh, in our town, and we've tried to do what we can to not, um, I guess, do things that are going to be harmful towards bats, because bats eat a lot of mosquitoes, and bats eat a lot of flies. And so, although I can't say that we don't have any mosquitoes in my backyard, I don't think that we have more mosquitoes than my peers who have sprayed their lawn. Because <laughs> actually, you could spray your lawn, and mosquitoes are still going to come, because they actually are flying insects. We actually have the mosquitoes largely under control by birds, bats, and other insects, like dragonflies. We have tons of dragonflies in our backyard. Um, you can do things. In, in Europe, it's actually very common to recommend having a small pond in your backyard that would have mosquitoes in them. Because I mean, that would have dragonflies in them because dragonflies when they're juvenile stage which is develops in fresh water they actually will eat the mosquitoes while the mosquitoes are babies to prevent them from even emerging in north america that hasn't really been a common recommendation just because of the historical way that people have done mosquito control here they actually don't recommend having any water standing water in your backyard because i think they assume people won't make the pond right it won't be deep enough and it'll just be like a puddle of water and mosquitoes will breed in it um but that is a recommendation that many people um, outside of North America have is to have, you know, small ponds um, because dragonflies will breed in them almost certainly and they will eat your mosquitoes for you. Um, but these, these decisions that you're making, which flowers you plant, having a variety of flowers, not having a monoculture, um, you know, keeping your lights off to allow the fireflies to do their flashing at night. Or say you, say you have to have your lights on for some period of time, turning them off maybe at nine, setting a, setting a limit for yourself. Like after nine, I'm going to turn my outside lights off and just give them some chance to find a mate. Um, you know, not spraying um, your lawn. In the beginning of the spring, when you have your first dandelions, that's some of the first food that pollinators can get. Your neighbors may not like it that you have dandelions, but the bees really are so glad that you have them. You know, leaving your clover, you know, leaving your lawn a, a few extra days between your mowing to let a little bit of clover go up before you mow over it. That's a great food source for a lot of, for flies, for all different things. Um, so there's these small decisions that you make that actually have pretty big cascading effects on, on insects overall. I think that's a wonderful. I mean, we haven't, we haven't used pesticides in 20 years since we moved into our land. Um, and that was just out of instinct. Um, not that I was into this at all at that time, but we've had so much farming around in our town that we feel like it seeps into our soil. Um, and cutting your lawn 
you know, regularly and low is just as good as anyone spraying. I, I, I you know, I would like to see head to head other people's lawns that that look any better, to be honest with you. And we 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 grab that stuff on our shoes and our paws of our pets and bring that into our home. So you yeah. can see that ecosystem of, of not just hurting of not just hurting pets, but uh, I'm sorry, of bugs or insects, but also kind of traipsing into our home um, and really kind of getting into all the little creatures as well as the big creatures in our environment. So I think those are wonderful recommendations. And um, and I'm going to be a little bit more uh, conscientious by far when I see bugs. I tend to grab them and put them under glass and let them go if I catch a bug <laughs> in my home. Uh, I usually think it's some Aunt Susie or some relative that I'm somehow going to get points with by letting yeah. them go. Um, but I have a harder time with, with spiders, unfortunately. So I have to keep working on that. Yeah, it's fine. So the, the the fellow that came by on the Segway, on his iPad, he had pictures of spiders and house centipedes. And that always kind of bothers me that people paint those as the bad guys, because if you don't want flies and mosquitoes in your house, keep spiders and house centipedes because they're predators. They'll eat the insects for you. They just want to have a little corner with their web to just do their thing. But they eat the things for you. You set it and forget it. It's like a nice little trap that you've made, and it'll get rid of, if a moth comes in by accident, trust me, the spider will get it. It wants it more than you do. <laughs> and then yeah. you're free. That's a wonder, that's actually a wonderful thought, because my kids have trouble with the spiders too, and yet I think to myself, we have very few pet, uh, pests pests other, other than some of these spiders, so maybe they're doing their job quite well. Yeah. And I have to pay thank them you, better. Spider. Yeah, thank you, Spider. <laughs> so I want to, um, you know, kind of move towards closing this conversation down in something, you know, maybe something hopeful and, you know, positive for the future. I wanted you to tell me what your goals are for the future because of all your work that you're doing and you continue to do um, and all this wonderful work at, at the American Museum of Natural History, which I think is just spectacular. Um, are you going to be doing more teaching, more writing? What does what your future hold in terms of the projects that you want to do? Well, we have a big uh, $2.5 million National Science Foundation grant right now. And the goal of this grant is to actually sequence the genomes, the entire genomes, just like what they did for the Human Genome Project, but yeah. for dragonflies, for all 6,000 species of dragonflies, um, as well as to collect behavioral data, ecological data, things like that. Um, and so that's going to keep me busy um, for the next couple of years. But in the meantime, we've also, you know, I have a book project right now. I'm writing a book about dragonflies that's for the general public, I guess, about the who's who and, and what they do. A lot of it's going to be about um, the reproductive behavior, which, as I mentioned, is pretty bizarre and unusual. And um, so that's going to be, I think, a fun project to work on. Is that going to be um, 50, as, sh 50 Shades of Insects or 50 Shades of Bugs? Because <laughs> that's how yeah, it will sell. I, <laughs> Dr. Ware, that, I will get my first copy, 50 Shades of Insects. Fifty Shades of Dragonflies. Yeah, they, they, they. There's nothing that humans could do uh, that would be more shocking than some of the things that dragonflies do because they do pretty bizarre things. Um, and they did it all first, of course. They did, they've been doing it for anything that you could come up with. They've been doing for a hundred million years. So, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Um, and then starting in November, I'll be the president of the Entomological Society of America, which is the largest insect organization in the world. Really, there's seven thousand members and. Um, in that role, I think a big part of my goal is really to, um, in fact, I, I picked a theme for my my to, my my term, uh, which is insect as insects as inspiration, and really I'm going to try and you know put out some products and material and and do things to really think about for people to think about insects in a different way, think about insects in art and music and cooking and fashion and and think about them as things other than just. The, the typical kind of dialogue of vectors of disease or pests or, um, you know, specimens in a museum. Um, so that's a big part of, I think, what the next year is going to hold as well. Um, and I think in general, I, I mean, I really do, I have graduate students, um, I have postdocs. Uh, oh, colleagues and I, we also uh, organized a collective called Entomologists of Color. Um, and this collective's goal is really to diversify the field of entomology um, through recruitment and retention. And so that's something that we've been actively working on, giving away free memberships to any students of color worldwide, uh, to entomological societies, as well as having, you know, international multilingual journal clubs and just bringing more people into the fold and getting more people excited about about insects. So I think it's going to be a busy a busy few years, uh, but a good a good time 
by all. And I think if people are listening and you want to get involved, there are so many ways to get involved. The Entomological Society of America is just one. They have citizen science grants. They have projects. There's people who are interested in having, who are interested in collaborating. We have one for dragonflies where people can help us kind of identify the dragonflies that are in their, in their backyard. And there's a migratory dragonfly uh, project as well that's looking for citizen scientists to work with them. All you need is your phone. It's an app and you just kind of push buttons when you see things. So if you're interested in kind of getting these baseline data, like we talked about, that are going to help us better understand insect decline and insect loss, um, join us. You know, you're welcome. We'd love to have you. That's terrific. And actually, what we'll do is, um, you know, at your leisure, you'll send over email or you'll email over some links that are really great for all of the things you just described so that people can really just go to the podcast at the bottom, see your bio, see all the information and and your favorite resources and, and different opportunities. So um, that'll be great. So people take a look at that when when this uh, when this drops this podcast. So anyway, I want to thank you so much for taking the time. I know how busy you are. Um, and the cicada is just, you know, I know that was just a huge time for you. You were everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. Um, so again, thank you for making the time to be part of the show and um and good luck with everything including your book um in 2022 which is coming out so i'm really excited for you thanks for contributing and doing all the work that you do thank you so much dr cohen thanks for the invitation and i'm really glad i got to chat with you and and to meet everybody virtually yep thank you i'll see you in the neighborhood bye bye see <laughs> see you <laughs>